Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you, the listener. Thanks to all of you. That includes High Tech Oki, Chris Zaragoza, Jim Hart, and Matt Misner. On this episode of DTNS, the real reasons Epic and Apple are fighting again, OpenAI responds to Elon Musk's lawsuit, and what Microsoft revealed about the future of consoles. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, March 6, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. So you've settled on Animal House. That's the studio name, seems That's like. That's the studio name. It is yeah. an Animal House here. Uh, I am also an animal because sure. we're all part of the kingdom. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. Not a fun uh, guy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a fun guy. I'm fun, but not a fun guy. Sure. Yeah. yeah. But also, you're an animal. Uh, I just am curious if you'll ever want to do a toga. No. Toga party. I would be delighted. Yeah. We'll have to pick uh, once that. the weather warms up, I might have to. Yeah, definitely not. <laughs> not now. <laughs> All right. Uh, we, got, uh, we, we have a lot of explaining to do for you people. That's what we're here to do so that you don't have to plow through all of the fighting and bickering out there. We're going to explain all this stuff to you. So let's start with the quick kids. TikTok introduced an invite-only beta in 2023 called the Creativity Program, which let creators monetize video longer than 60 seconds as a way to help them make more money. That went, went away, but TikTok now says the program will be resurrected, called Creator Rewards, encouraging longer-form habits, even like shooting in horizontal mode. TikTok is also adding more options for longer, but not necessarily live streamed content, like charging fans for exclusive content and benefits, selling perks like badges, emotes, and subscriber-only chats. I can only imagine what TikTok has been going for here. Mm, hopefully they've been going for continuing to do business in the United States uh, because the U.S. presidential administration is backing a bipartisan bill. Hey, look at that. The White House... And both parties in Congress all agree that they should ban TikTok in the United States or or they gave them an alternative. We'll either ban you TikTok or ByteDance, the parent company, can sell TikTok to someone to operate it in the U.S. Otherwise, they're going to tell operators of web hosts and it was web hosts and, and app stores, but I can't, it wasn't exactly web hosts. Anyway, they're going to say you cannot distribute TikTok in the United States. Bill set for markup Thursday in the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, if it gets through a classified hearing with officials from the FBI, Justice Department and Office of the Director of National Intelligence. There's a lot going on here. Uh, so our politics guy, Justin Robert Young, is going to talk about it a little bit more tomorrow. Indeed. More than 100 AI researchers have signed an open letter aimed at companies developing AI. OpenAI, Meta, Anthropic, Google, Midjourney, all part of this, calling on them to allow researchers better investigative access into their systems. The researchers argue current restrictions that are designed to keep bad actors from abusing AI systems, which is good on its own, is keeping researchers who are trying to do good from testing tools that a lot of us now have access to. The researchers are asking for a legal and technical safe harbor during testing to investigate what works and what still needs work. An accompanying policy proposal co-authored by some of the signatories of this note does note that there is progression. For example, OpenAI updated its terms to protect academic safety research, though the letter claims some ambiguity uh, ambiguity remains. Yeah. Um, security security researchers have been fighting similar battles over the years, some of which they've won. So uh, I imagine they can, they can help give some advice uh, on this. Meta is making WhatsApp and Messenger interoperable with third-party messaging services as we come up on that March 7th deadline to comply with the European Union's Digital Markets Act. Meta now says it will ask third parties to use the signal protocol, which both Messenger and WhatsApp currently use for encryption, unless the developer is able to demonstrate another option offers the same security guarantees as Signal. Seems reasonable. 
Apple released iOS and iPad OS 17.4 with a host of changes, including prompting UEU users rather to use a default browser instead of Safari just being the default choice that can be changed later. It was always able to be changed, but it was always the default app. Now, Apple's podcast app has automatic transcriptions if directly published to Apple's podcast catalog. With, with chapter notes included, which is kind of nice, transcripts are available in English, French, German, and Spanish. We also have some new emoji, including a lime slice, a person mm. using a wheelchair, among others. But in the EU specifically, due to new DMA rules, alternative app marketplaces are now allowed by Apple. However, the company says it's going to geo-restrict you if you happen to be away from home. If you live in an EU-designated country you say you live in for too long. Doesn't say exactly how long long is, but long enough. Apple says geolocation will happen on device, and your exact location is not being tracked and not shared with Apple servers. So basically, they didn't tell us how long, but if you leave the EU, you don't lose access to your third-party stuff immediately. Just I, I, I would guess something like we a 30 did. day thing. Like, yeah, so okay. We'll find out, yeah. Like if you're, you know, if you're on vacation, mm -hmm. this is, you know, you know, you can't be docked for that. If you're away from home for, you know, more than 30 days, I would, I would. Suspect, well, we don't know if it's 30 days. We don't, know. I don't No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm literally yeah. just, I, I'm just spitballing that probably something, something like that. that might be a flag. Yeah. All right. And that are the quick hits. OpenAI published a letter, an uh, open letter on Tuesday uh, that can be uh, read by anybody in response to Elon Musk's legal claims against OpenAI that OpenAI reneged on its official and initial nonprofit mission to help humanity. That's what Musk says you were supposed to do when I was part of this company, which I'm no longer part of. It, uh, Musk says... Uh, OpenAI has now pivoted to a for-profit company instead that benefits itself and Microsoft, because Microsoft and OpenAI obviously work very closely together. Musk was a founder, no longer has a board seat, but still is a current investor. OpenAI says that Musk wanted to merge with Tesla or give Musk broader control of the company overall back in the day and has published some emails uh, illustrating as such. In its rebuttal, OpenAI says uh, Musk uh, said that uh, back starting in 2016, that OpenAI really shouldn't be as open about sharing its research as it had been in the past up until that point, because that could overly benefit competitors. And Google was listed as a company that needed to be watched. Basically, uh, OpenAI is saying Musk, Musk says that we've 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 closed things down. We've become a whole for-profit company, which was never something that he would have ever invested in in the future. However, we have some receipts that show that he wanted us to do things differently, particularly looking at Google as a competitor that was going to get a leg up over OpenAI if OpenAI didn't lock things down. All right, let, let's get a few things out of the way right right, right up the top. OpenAI's blog post is not part of its court case. There are two things going on here. Elon Musk is suing OpenAI for breach of contract, which will be a very difficult case to win because he's got to prove that the founder's agreement is somehow a contract with him and that somehow OpenAI breached it. And the accusations are because they created an, a for-profit subsidiary that they've broken their promise about not being for profit, even though OpenAI remains a nonprofit. And that is totally normal. If that sounds weird to you, it's just because you haven't encountered this. Mozilla does this. Mozilla is a nonprofit foundation, operates Firefox, but there is a for-profit subsidiary of Mozilla that operates as well. So it's going to be a, a long road for Musk to try to prove this. A lot of people think that he's just messing with OpenAI by filing this lawsuit. Now, we also have the public spat, and that's what Sarah was just telling us about, which is, well, he said this, but guess what? I have an email where he was a hypocrite and he said that, and that really doesn't impact the court case at all. This is all just trying to get us to join in and cheer for one billionaire or another. Well, it seems to me that that is 100% correct. I also feel very strongly, and I'd, I'd love to be told different here, 
But it seems to me that it would be negligent on the part of OpenAI to uh, not want to be more protective of their their systems, their methods, their trade secrets. Uh, whether or not they should have stuck to some original thing about being for the betterment of humanity and never for profit, that's maybe a moral thing that maybe should be talked about and, and maybe that should color the way we think of OpenAI. But if I am a company and I am now trying to find ways to be profitable, I want to be able to have some protection of the stuff I do. And I don't think that that's that that's that crazy. Yeah. And OpenAI's charter does talk about being open within reason. You know, uh, this the, again, that leaves a lot of room for interpretation of like where responsible. Yeah. And you have lots of documentation of OpenAI saying, we don't think it's safe to put this out in the open. Uh, and, and in fact, if you go listen to the episode of Know a Little More that I did on OpenAI, you'll note that they stopped open sourcing things before they started the for-profit company. Uh, uh, GPT-2 on February 14th, 2019 was the first model that was not open source. March 11th, 2019, they created the for-profit subsidiary. Now, those are close, and they obviously knew they were going to do the for-profit subsidiary, so you could still argue it's it's maybe just greedy and, and doing it for the money. Uh, but most of the documentation shows that they were also doing it for safety. So I think the argument is, well, what percentage of their decision is greedy and what percentage of their decision is safety? I think they should be more open. I look at what Meta does. I look at what Apple does. I look at what Anthropic does and I and, and, and Stable Diffusion. And I'm like, you, they, open AI could be more open. It's, it's, it's going to be fine. Uh, but it's not like what they're doing. Suddenly. It's literally in their name, too. So I, <laughs> I understand yeah, that, you know, yeah. as this thing began, it had a much more open idea around it. But like other stuff, I mean, remember Google's don't be evil thing that went away because, you know, you, you kind of can't help but be a little evil when you're that big. Um, this isn't <laughs> don't be exactly too this, evil wasn't a good. Slip exactly. <laughs> this isn't quite the same as that. <laughs> don't I mean, it's a real unless you're really big. <laughs> this is definitely a direction change for them. But in light of how competitive, I mean, part of me just feels like opening. I was maybe in a bit of a naive position early, like a lot of us, like most companies probably were. they weren't really sure where this was going to go or how quickly it would be adopted or how seismic it would be in tech. And it has been all of those things. And mm -hmm. I could totally see opening eye going to, ah, we got to scramble and figure out what the heck we're doing. Oh, what yeah. is our future? You know, also they, uh, uh, go ahead, Tom. Oh no, real quickly. Th they thought they could be fully open. And then Google came along with the transformer, which is by the way, the T in GPT. And they realized we need money to compete with Google. Google has all of these servers and all this compute power and transformers are, are hungry for compute power. We need money to do that. So if we're going to fulfill our mission of protecting humanity from the negatives of AI, we have to continue to be able to keep pace with Google and to do that, we need more money. Yeah. That makes sense. Yep. Me. Uh, well, Xbox streamed its 2024 partner preview this morning. The event highlighted third party announced new games and revealed new gameplay footage for titles coming to the console and Windows PC. And, and Scott, you, you pay attention to this. It might sound like it was, you know, a pretty mundane announcement, but a lot of folks had their eyes on this in particular. Why was that? Well, part of it is a huge part of it is because Microsoft has been in a weird rumor mill slash uh, controversy cycle lately. Some of that came from statements from their own people saying, you know, uh, we're, we're more interested in services than consoles. People are taking a lot of that stuff, which we talked about on previous Wednesdays, a lot of that stuff to mean that they're getting out of the Xbox console business and going to focus on game services. And then there was this whole thing with them putting their games, some of their exclusive or previously exclusive games on PlayStation 5 uh, and Nintendo platforms and maybe even more in the future. These are all controversial ideas. They're all interesting shifts. And I think a lot of people thought all of that meant that today's presentation might include maybe some details, some plans, some of those games going third party. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, what they're maybe they were going to get out in front of a camera and maybe address some of this directly. They did none of that today. They talked about a bunch of really cool looking games, um, which will come to uh, have a point where or why this matters in a minute. But they showed a lot. We're not going to talk about all of it, but there are some big ones like this Unknown Nine. The Awakening game looks really neat. The Sinking City 2 is highly anticipated. Final Fantasy 14 used to be a PlayStation 5 console exclusive, as well as PC. That is now coming on the 21st of this month to uh, Xbox platform. So they even talked about a little bit of a, a third-party shift there. 
Um, Frostpunk 2, another good example. Great lineup shown today. A bunch of stuff we didn't know about, a few that we did. But my big takeaway was everybody thought this was going to be about this, these rumors, these problems, supposed problems, uh, or this upheaval. And Microsoft's like, no, we're, we're just here to talk about all these games we have coming. Uh, we've invested a ton in third party, uh, <coughs> excuse me, third party relationships and in our own first party studios. And now that's all coming to fruition. We're starting to see the results of those things. And here they are. And we're going to do it in 30 minutes. And guess what? We'll probably do a bunch of these per year. And we're making games. And you should subscribe to Game Pass because you'll be able to play these games wherever <laughs> right. you play them. Like, it really is that simple. I feel like Microsoft It was like an said, upbeat and short <laughs> announcement. Yeah. And it was very much them sort of just creating this tunnel of cut it out. Every, I mean, they didn't say this overtly, but it's like, okay, you can all be yapping around the periphery all you want. This we are literally on track for what we have been planning all this time. We are doing it, and here's what we're making. So, hey, gamers, you want to play some games? Here's some games. No controversy, no rumors, no layoffs, no nothing. Just well, no, no talk about the layoffs. There were layoffs, but just here's straight ahead our plan for Game Pass and our plan for the Xbox brand. And that plan is what it has always been, which is here are a bunch of games coming. See you in a couple of months for each of these, and also we'll see you soon for another one of these where we'll talk about even more games that are coming. And I think that's that's Xbox from now on. That's what we hear. I mean, besides the overly positive news about new games, hey, gamers, we got new games coming. Was there anything that you particularly thought Microsoft should have addressed? Um, not really, because they kind of already have, even though I thought that their podcast they did with uh, Phil Spencer was a little tepid and controlled, and they didn't really, I don't know, that didn't really reveal much. It was a kind of a big nothing um, I do think, I do think transparency from Microsoft and Sony and Nintendo is a good thing when it comes to the relationship with the players. Um, but like we were just talking about with OpenAI and others, they don't always want to be so transparent. They kind of want to just execute the plans they've been secretly working on at their headquarters for all these months and years. And so I don't know what I, what I would have wanted to pry out of them specifically. It would have been cool to hear about, well, which of their other games that haven't been confirmed yet might be on their way to competing consoles, just so we kind of know. Mm -hmm. But this isn't the place for that. There's probably another event for that. Instead, this event was funny because there were two or three of these titles that were previously Sony exclusives that are now coming to Xbox, um, which is a complete flip around from what everybody expected the talk to be about. So my overall takeaway is this is Microsoft and this is Xbox and this is what we're going to hear from now on. We're not going to, they're not going to get down in the trenches with all the infighting and the brand warfare. They're just, that is not going to be their plan. It's, it's weird to think that a normal announcement is shocking somehow, right. but it kind of was in, the, in this particular case, wasn't it? Yeah, for sure. Ah, uh, well, there you go, folks. Sorry to disappoint, or, or I'm sure Microsoft is sorry to disappoint you with, with <laughs> you know, not with some out. great game announcements. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Exactly. <laughs> How could they? How <laughs> dare they? Uh, you know, the other thing in your life that you probably need is Android. A lot of y'all are always telling, saying, why do you always talk about Apple? By the way, all the Apple people say, why do you always talk about Android? But if you're on the Android side of that fence, then listen to Android Faithful every week. Ron Richards, Huen Tui Dao, Michelle Ramon, and Jason Howell bring you the latest Android news and information. They had a great show yesterday. Uh, they'll have a great show next Tuesday. You can catch it live on our YouTube YouTube and Twitch channels, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific on Tuesday, youtube.com slash daily tech news show, or subscribe to the feed at androidfaithful.com. All right, everyone, get your bingo cards out uh, because you may or may <laughs> not have <laughs> thought that Apple might terminate Epic's developer account again. It did. Spoiler alert. Thwarting its plans to bring a third-party app store to iOS in Europe. Now, under the DMA, Digital Markets Act, Apple has to allow third parties to offer app stores separate from Apple's own. But the fight with Epic has some more details going on. So let's go through step-by-step. Tom, how did this start? Yeah, let, let's all remember 2020. The only thing that happened in 2020 was Epic and Apple began fighting, right? That's that's what 2020 is best known for. But no, it, it was when Apple 
took issue with the fact that Epic started listing an alternative payment option in Fortnite for iOS. They just did it. They didn't get approval from Apple. It wasn't a change of policy. And so Apple kicked Fortnite out of the App Store and said, no, you, you aren't allowed to do that. And they went so far as to revoke Epic's developer account. Epic and Apple sued each other in the United States. That's now very famous. Apple won on most of the counts, certainly all the counts that matter for what we're talking about today. And during the trial, Epic CEO Tim Sweeney testified that his company deliberately violated its developer agreement to make a point that this was unfair. Now, that fact is going to be important in a minute. In the meantime, uh, since that trial happened and that decision was put forth, Europe passed the Digital Markets Act, which Sarah just mentioned, uh, which, among other things, requires Apple to allow third party app stores. Now, you might say, OK, well, everything's kosher, right? Hmm, not so much. Epic plan to offer a third party app store. All good. But that alone is not the cause of the trouble between Epic and Apple that rages to this day. It's how Apple is allowing third-party app stores that Epic takes issue with, right? Yeah, exactly. On January 25th, Apple announced the terms of its compliance with the DMA. There's a lot to it, but the important parts for Epic uh, were, according to Tim Sweeney, that Apple was charging a 50 cent per copy core processing fee if an app passed more than a million stall installs within the European Union, something that Fortnite is likely to do. So e Epic was definitely going to have to pay that. Uh, and Apple was also going to require a bunch of other paperwork, like letters of credit and stuff. Uh, though today it actually modified some of the letters of credit and corporation stuff uh, and said it wouldn't do that. Okay, so we know Epic CEO, who has been a very vocal critic of Apple's policies uh, for some time now, Tim Sweeney, called the plan, quote, a devious new instance of malicious compliance. Uh, it said, uh, he also said it was on illegal anti-competitive scheme rife with new junk fees on downloads and new Apple taxes on payments they don't process. Okay, political speak here, but he still applied for a new developer account under Epic's Swedish subsidiary, which Apple has approved. What went wrong? Yeah, they did approve it until they unapproved it. Uh, on February 23rd, Apple's head of the App Store, Phil Schiller, you may have seen him in the Apple announcements, sent an email to Sweeney, which Sweeney has made public so we can take a look at it, saying that he hoped that, that Tim was well. I hope you're well. Uh, saw the comments about the junk fees and the Apple taxes, and I was just wondering <laughs> if you planned to try to violate the terms of your development agreement this time around. Uh, here's, here's Schiller's exact words. Your colorful criticism of our DMA compliance plan, coupled with Epic's past practice of intentionally violating contractual provisions with which it disagrees, strongly suggests that Epic Sweden does not intend to follow the rules. So Schiller asked for written assurances and said, please tell us why we should trust Epic this time. Now, within three hours, Sweeney wrote a paragraph back to Phil, just, just a paragraph, and said that, quote, Epic and its subsidiaries are acting in good faith and will comply with all the terms of current and future agreements with Apple and will gladly provide Apple with any specific further assurances on the topic that you'd like. Thank you very much. Press set. <laughs> Hope you are well. <laughs> Okay, so uh, short but sweet rebuttal here. Why did Apple object? Yeah, so you might say like, well, he said that he wouldn't do it. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, a week later, on March 2nd, Apple's lawyers sent Epic a memo writing that Sweeney's response to Schiller was, quote, wholly insufficient and not credible. It boiled down to an unsupported trust us. History shows, however, that Epic is verifiably untrustworthy, hence the request for meaningful commitments and the minimal assurances in Mr. Sweeney's curt response are swiftly undercut by a litany of public attacks on Apple's policies, compliance plan, and business model. Uh, and then they linked to a February 26 Twitter post uh, and referred to the two companies' ongoing court case in Australia. There's a similar epic Apple case in Australia to the one that was in the U.S. that's still being litigated. Uh, and then that memo finished with the notification that Apple terminated Epic Sweden's developer account. Oh, man. Oh, man. I mean, this is tech theater at its best. Uh, Scott, knowing all of this, hearing all of this, what's latest, who are you going with? 
Well, that's hard to say. I don't Dad, know. Dad, they're fighting. I'm going with, you know what I'm going with? I'm going with this might be good in the long run for policy slash, you know, what companies should or shouldn't do in terms of their policies when it comes to this sort of thing. Um, there's no doubt that Apple has a, a, a return to what we used to call the walled garden, AOLs of the world, that sort of thing. And they've done it pretty deftly over a bunch of years since 2008 and call it the app store and it's worked for them and they get a lot of extra money out of it, a lot of money. And I, so I understand Sweeney's position. I understand Epic's position, why they want to cut back on that. The truth is though, they also make a ton of money in their own ways. Um, I think that this probably is not going to end well for either Apple or Epic. Someone's going to have to compromise or both are going to have to compromise whether it's legally or just officially or whatever they're going to do to make it work. Or uh, by order of a judge. <laughs> by order of a judge, exactly. And no one's going to want to do it. Or when forced. Or yeah. when forced to. But here's the thing that Tim Sweeney, the creator of the original Unreal Engine and the creator of Unreal and Unreal Tournament, he has, he has an opportunity here to do the funniest thing ever. He should bring a Phil Schiller skin to the game of Fortnite. <laughs> oh, no. And just it's put it in. Don't even it. ask. Scott Don't Johnson. even get permission. Really? They should just bring Phil Schiller in. Everybody can buy the Phil Schiller skin. They make a little extra money on the Phil Schiller skin. I'm telling you, it would be amazing, and there's nothing... It should stop him. I don't think, well, maybe Phil uh, Schiller. Get, Phil Schiller could sue for use of his likeness, don't you think? That's true. Uh, Phil, Philip Schill, Schillhar will be the name of the character, and we're all good. But anyway, my, that's obviously a silly because idea. Because we're but, not petty people here. and we I just think that makes the things. problem worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it probably does. I guess what I'm saying is I don't, I don't know what gamers Schill will filler. ultimately, like will gamers actually <laughs> benefit from this ultimately? I don't know. Schill filler. Sorry, Shell that's filler. Funny. I like that. It's yeah, pretty good. That's that's, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. I want. I'd like to see it. So whenever this is over and said and done with, that gamers aren't the ones just standing there going, "Okay, can we please just play our game on your platform?" Because that part has been a real bummer. Yeah, yeah. And no, exactly. We'll uh, and well, and, and that's what always happens with cases that drag out years and years, such as mm -hmm. this. Is you know yeah. the end user is sort of like. Oh, can I not do this thing right now? Oh, somebody, you know, has decided to, um, you know, I don't know, open a new investigation or, uh, you know, push back against the company that, uh, that sued it. If you, if you follow the stuff, then you know, but a lot of people don't. Yeah, um, who snubbed who at the Christmas party here? That's what this feels like. It's like kind of, these, yeah. these two get along in so many other ways and have in the past. Yeah. If they, if they had a healthy relationship, you know, Phil sends a like, hey, you're not going to do this again, are you? And even if Tim sends a, a curt response, Apple should respond with it like, you know, that's not good enough. I, I need you to do more rather than waiting a week for him to say something kind of benign. He just said, you know, Apple's leadership really has a decision to make. Like it wasn't the worst thing he's ever written. And they're like, and look at that horrible thing you wrote on Twitter. Uh, we're getting rid of your developer account. This isn't how you handle it. This isn't how people who want to come to an agreement handle it. Yep. So, yeah. It's uh, it's very unfortunate to see. Uh, however, uh, what's not unfortunate is the fact that we have the greatest audience in the world, and they write to us in the mailbag. Indeed. Uh, so we had a conversation yesterday on EV batteries, how they act in cold weather, and why sometimes you can't get a great charge. Uh, really good conversation. Thanks to all of you who wrote in. Uh, one from TJ uh, wrote, living in what used to be cold and snowy Minnesota... I guess, I don't know. Now it's not. Uh, TJ says, I have decades of experience with cold cars in winter. My buddy has a Tesla vehicle. They do actually heat the battery itself in the winter. He would mention that part of this charge was going to heating the battery. I never quite understood why until now. Electric engine block heaters actually heat the engine block, and that transfers the heat into the motor oil, so it's less vicious, and allows the engine to turn over easier. Modern motor oils now flow easier in cold weather, so this is much less a thing, but still exists in places like Winnipeg, where many public parking lots still have outlets for block heaters. Yeah, so that last is about diesel engines needing the block heaters, not about the electric vehicles, uh, right. which is which is a different thing. Chip in Boston uh, wrote in and said, all EVs have a coolant loop running through the battery, kind of like a liquid-cooled PC. That coolant loop also runs through a heater and cooling core, which allows the battery to be warmed in the winter or cooled in the summer. Now, now Chip, 
other people wrote in and said it's not all, that some of the older ones didn't have that, but maybe all the modern ones do. Uh, most EVs have a preconditioning feature where you can manually or on a schedule tell the car to prepare the battery and or cabin for a drive. The idea is you would do this while the car's plugged in, so you use house power instead of battery power. This makes the car more efficient while driving, thus giving you more range. For example, my Mustang Mach-E has up to two scheduled departure times I can set each day. I have those set for when I'm going to work and when I'm going home, depending on the temp outside the car, will precondition the battery and cabin so it's ready by the time I have set. Usually when I do that, I can see my range increase from 10 to 15 percent because the battery pack is so big, it can retain this preconditioning for hours. So you don't need to do it every time you drive or even right before you drive. This is most useful if you're going on a road trip and want to maximize your range. That's a lot of people pointed intel. out it's a, a, a heat pump, uh, like Tesla uses a heat pump for this, so it's energy efficient. And Allison Sheridan texted me this morning and said not only does it do the preconditioning for the heating it actually cools it if 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 you're in a hot situation in the summer so yeah it goes yeah. both ways i just want to thank everyone like i feel like that's something we should have got right on yesterday's show but everyone was so kind in their responses to be like oh they actually have that let me explain it to you so so thanks everybody for that really appreciate that indeed yeah we got a I mean, it's always nice to get a lot of good feedback and please keep those those emails or however you get a hold of us uh feedback coming because it really makes our show better thank you in advance also, thanks to you, Scott Johnson, for being with us today. What would you like to tell folks about? Well, uh, so t uh, two things. My sister lives in the Twin Cities, and she says there's been, like, no winter this year. So that's what he's talking about. It's very weird. It's like ah, no, one, uh -huh. no one understands yeah. why. Number two, I do a show called Core on Thursdays. It's all about video games. And what we didn't talk today uh, or about today with the Microsoft stuff was the games themselves. Well, if you want to hear what those were, and some of those surprises, we're going to dig deep into those tomorrow uh, tomorrow evening on that show. So check it out. Go sub today wherever you get your podcasts, or you can find it at frogpants.com slash core. Patrons, stick around for the extended show Good Day Internet. Find out what happens when an AI engineer currently working at Microsoft, still working at Microsoft, stops being polite and starts getting real. And telling everybody, senators and the FTC and CNBC, there's something wrong with Copilot Designer. Oh, I mean, if that's not a promo, I don't know what is. But just a reminder, we do this show live and you can catch it live at, uh, Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back talking about a bill that would force ByteDance to sell TikTok tomorrow with Justin Robert Young, because he's going to know. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>